Colorado's governor was not the first to issue an executive order protecting abortion access and privacy. And we've known all along that our surrounding states are doing what I term experiments in cruelty. Democrats at the state legislature want to put some of those policies into state law. First, they have to hold on to power in November. Superior wanted superior gun laws. A gun rights group believes a recent Supreme Court decision makes them unconstitutional. With so much focus on fentanyl and substance abuse, why is the state still failing to get those who need help, help? What happened at City Park is not how you Colorado. I texted Steve Stagger and said, dude, I am pissed off. And why a gift from a next viewer made my eyes water, all 12 of them, next. We just finished one election and we have to start talking about the next and the issue that could decide some of those races women's rights. Colorado's Democratic governor issued an executive order to protect patients and providers from other states seeking to criminalize abortion access. Democratic lawmakers want to take that executive order and put it into state law and then some. That cannot happen until next year. And there's an election between then and now that will decide if that can even happen. The executive order by Democratic Governor Jared Polis to protect providers of abortion access and to protect information about patients who come from out of state seeking abortion access, that was the eighth of its kind in the U.S. Colorado joined Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Mexico, Nevada, Rhode Island, Maine, and North Carolina with some form of governor's executive order protecting abortion access, protecting patients, or limiting information sharing. If Democrats keep control of the Colorado State Senate after November, expect more of this to be put into state law next year. It's, it's right now a lot of, quite frankly, legal re research. Democratic State Senator Julie Gonzalez and Democratic State Representative Meg Froelich sponsored this year's Reproductive Health Equity Act, RIA. It put into state law the current abortion access rights that already existed in Colorado. They are already working on what they call RIA 2.0. We're going to do everything that we can um, to fight back against any type of um, policy or law from other states uh, that seek to harm um, patients or providers. And we need to make sure that both patients and providers are safe in Colorado, including folks that are traveling here. Just like the executive order from Polis, Colorado would not be the first to create new abortion access protections. Other states have started, and Colorado is looking at those policies as guidance. A Connecticut law was enacted uh, wanting to protect providers and patients. That serves as a model, but also has to be sussed out. Maryland is enhancing provider capacity by providing grants and scholarships. While other states are looking at laws that would try to make it a crime to go to another state to get an abortion, Colorado Democrats are looking at laws to limit the information that can be released. Maybe it's a, an enhancement of our already existing um, HIPAA forms or just a clarification that that exists in Colorado already and that you, no matter where your state of residence, are protected. For the Democrats to add more of those protections, it will require two things, keeping control of the governor's office and keeping control of the state Senate. The state Senate currently has 20 Democrats and 15 Republicans. If Republicans can flip three seats in November, they would regain control for the first time since 2018. And with the Republican Senate and a Democratic House, it is very unlikely that any additional abortion access protection would be passed, regardless of who's governor. On this topic, may I make a recommendation? Faith Miller at Colorado Newsline broke down the five key Senate seats to watch on election night in November. District 3 in Pueblo, District 8 in Northwest Colorado, District 11 in Colorado Springs, District 15 in Larimer and Boulder Counties, and District 27 in Aurora and Centennial. We have shared her article on the Nine News Facebook page. From one issue that splits political parties to another, the far-right gun rights group Rocky Mountain Gun Owners has sued the town of Superior after the town council passed tougher gun laws. The lawsuit in federal court says the new town ordinance is unconstitutional. Superior recently voted to ban assault weapons in large capacity magazines. Louisville and Boulder also passed stricter gun laws. The cities can do so because a state law approved this past year gives local governments the power to pass tougher gun regulations than the state has. This new lawsuit says the regulations are unconstitutional based on a Supreme Court decision last month. 
The Supreme Court struck down a gun law in New York that restricted carrying a concealed handgun outside the home. Now a federal court will decide how to interpret that decision with what Superior has passed. The growing fire threat, drought conditions, and climate change are a national problem. A handful of Coloradans will get a chance to help shape federal policy on how we react to wildfires and prevent them from happening. The Departments of Interior, Agriculture, and Homeland Security announced today who will serve on the Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission. That commission was created out of President Biden's infrastructure law. They'll tackle how to prevent mitigate, suppress, and manage wildfires. There are five non-federal members from Colorado, including Dan Gibbs, who leads the state's Department of Natural Resources, and Mike Morgan with the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control. Other Coloradans specialize in public utilities and wildfire strategy. Their work starts with a call later this month, and they'll prepare a report with recommendations and submit them to Congress before August 2023. Today, we got a reality check. After a decade of accelerated work on the opioid crisis to get more people into treatment, there is still a huge gap. Two-thirds of people who want or need help struggle to get it in Colorado. Anusha Roy joins us. And Anusha, we've talked about treatment for so many years on this show, and today we get this progress report. Yeah, I mean, with so many, along with so many people, I've just been reading headline after headline about fentanyl and Colorado's new laws, and then I found myself looking for some context around all of this. So I talked to Dr. Rob Valak, a drug addiction expert, and the very first thing that he brought up was treatment. Dr. Valak is with the Consortium on Substance Use Prevention and said that Colorado has a 60% treatment gap. We are talking six out of 10 cannot or are struggling to get into treatment because they don't have insurance. There aren't enough providers. There's still stigma. And here's the thing that is actually considered better than so much of the rest of the country. Well, if the country was at 84% 10 years ago, 81 to 84% treatment gap, and we've reduced down to about 60, and most of the country is down to about 75% treatment gap, well then on the one hand, we're doing better than most states in addressing that. But everybody still has a long way to go. If we're one of the best, and we still have six out of 10 people struggle to get treatment, whew, it's kind of like, you know, we're the, we're the best of still struggling to do a good job with this. So we're talking about a 20%, roughly 20% reduction. And what did work was Medicaid covering treatment, growing the workforce, expanding treatment programs, especially in rural areas where that gap is a lot more pronounced. That work, though, that is taking years as the crisis is getting worse. Of course, we've been hearing a lot about fentanyl. And yes, it is a huge culprit in this crisis, but it also isn't the only one. So our lack of resources or helping a person before developing addiction and after. Demand will still be where it is. If people can't get treatment, well, then their only choice is to remain taking what they're taking and getting it from the same place they're getting it, which is on the street. And the economy stays there. And someone will meet that. Someone will meet that demand. So, of course, the rules are changing here. Colorado's new laws are putting more resources towards harm reduction and treatment, but they're also stiffening felony charges for dealing fentanyl, as well as heightening the felony charges for possessing one to four grams of fentanyl. And so now the question and what a lot of people are watching for is how that's going to actually play out in the state. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the, the enforcement from mm -hmm. the fentanyl bill, but not the treatment side. So is there a report required or anything that tells us that treatment is lacking? Yeah, and here's the thing is that uh, Dr. Valak says that he thinks this is really going to highlight that gap that we're already seeing in Colorado. What he is worried about is will people be able to get the help that they need before getting in trouble with law enforcement? What about afterwards? And one of the things that the law will be doing is it's requiring all jails to provide medication assisted treatment. Yeah. Now, before it was optional. So a couple of jails, a lot of them actually were doing it, but we didn't see it universally in the state. And that is supposed to be changed. Changing. Will it reveal anything else about the crisis compared to other states? 
Yeah, and I mean, I think at this point, you know, Colorado is doing a little bit better, but, you know, one of the things that Dr. Valak said is he's really hoping for this balanced approach. You know, you see the state, part of that law, focusing on the criminal side. He said it's important to go after the cartels and big players, but at the same time, you know, what you hear from him and so many of the people on the grounds, you keep hearing about treatment and lack of resources and how are we going to address that? This is the problem with, I feel like it was a 70 some odd page bill. Maybe I'm misremembering. Why? Well, it was long. This is the problem. We focus so much on one little bit, then there's all these things that we haven't all talked about. All these yet. other little elements. Thank you, Anusha. Who is living in Colorado's prisons? More directly, where are they from? Denver had some unexpected cleanup at a new playground this morning. It was just hate. Pure and simple. We won't show you what it said, but we'll let you hear what the Parks Department had to say and something good coming out of the devastation in Ukraine. It does feel like it's a good thing that everyone has kind of come together around. That's next. The disproportionate impact on communities of color is highlighted in a new report about where people are from before they land in Colorado's prisons. More populated areas like Denver, Aurora, and Colorado Springs send a disproportionately high rate of people to prison. About 14,000 Coloradans are locked up in state prisons. This data comes from a report by the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition and the Prison Policy Initiative. El Paso, Denver, Arapaho, Jefferson, and Adams counties, some of the darker color uh, counties on that map are where 65% of the prison population is from, yet that area makes up only 55% of the state's population. However, there are high prison rates for people from Alamosa, Bent, and Logan counties, along with small cities like Alamosa, Sterling, and Pueblo. By the way, Alamosa and Bent are two communities with large Latino and Native American populations. Denver makes up 12% of the state population, but 20% of prisoners are from the capital city. The report found a stark contrast within Denver, especially in neighborhoods with more people of color. People in the Elyria Swansea neighborhood are 20 times more likely to be in prison than people who live in Wash Park West. Tagging a playground with racial and homophobic slurs is definitely not how you Colorado. This is why we can't have nice things. Jerks vandalized a new multi-million dollar playground in Denver City Park. Parks and Rec spotted it this morning quickly and cleaned it up to keep as many kids from seeing it as possible. The deputy parks director was pretty upset by the hateful slurs and knew who to reach out to. As soon as I got this, the first text I did was I texted Steve Stagger and said, dude, I am pissed off. And so, and he got right back to me because he knows when I text him, he knows it's something that, you know, is, is, is impacts everybody in the city. You know what? Instead of painting it on this playground that we just built, paint it on your own house. Let everybody know that you're a racist. Let everybody know that you hate. But don't bring it out here in, in a beautiful park space and paint it on this playground where we have children playing and families gathering. Scott is passionate about city parks. Uh, the department is sharing the photos with Denver Police's graffiti unit. Police hope they can find a match in their database to identify the person who graffitis similar to that. Another stormy afternoon across eastern Colorado. You can kind of see some darker skies. Little sunshine trying to sneak in across downtown, but we actually had a pretty nice thunderstorm cruise across DIA about two hours ago. Most of the action now east of I-25. You can see there's those cells in eastern Adams and Arapahoe County. For now, maybe a couple of light little rain showers. We'll be watching out for a few showers, I would say, now between about 8 p.m. and then the threat for seeing any kind of severe storms moves off to the east. So far, so good. How about a half inch out of DIA? and slightly above our average. We'll take it. By about 11 o'clock or so tonight, you're noticing just a few isolated storms just to the east of the Mestro area, but all of those move out by early tomorrow. The sunshine is back. We'll be watching this ridge of high pressure building back in, so the moisture really is going to be limited for us tomorrow afternoon. Might find a 
few isolated storms that cross the urban corridor, but most of them will line up across the eastern plains by about dinner time. And that really is going to be the area I'm watching out for for just a marginal threat for seeing some severe storms with the gusty winds being our biggest threat tomorrow. The heat's on as we're back to the 90s. I know. Here we go as far as the summer season goes and look ahead to the weekend. Whoa, 100 degrees possible on Sunday. Too hot for even my seven day forecast, but a cool off does come Marshall early next week. Ukraine still needs help. Coloradans are once again stepping up. We are all doing this because we have passion for Ukraine. And my tie clip collection got a lot more stylish. I'll tell you why next. What's happening in Ukraine is not getting as much attention lately. Ukrainian troops are trying to push back another Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. A key Ukrainian city fell to Russian control this week. Coloradans are still trying to support Ukraine from afar. And today, more than 50 restaurants and cafes are doing what they can to help. I am good. How are you doing? I think people generally are very, very supportive. I just want to start by to say again, thank you so much for participating in of this course. event. We see a lot of support from the United States and we're extremely, extremely grateful. Okay. Thank you. We Thanks to you too. My you. name is Anastasia Pavlenko. I am one of the volunteers for the Sunflower Seeds for Ukraine. I'm extremely excited for this event. We're all doing this because we have passion for Ukraine. Ooh. I myself still have family back in Ukraine and you know, you just, you know, you have this very first-hand experience to see how people are still struggling and how much help they need both on the front lines but also in the regular cities. Each of the restaurants participating, they agreed to donate a share of their proceeds from today to our organization. The money will be sent to Ukraine. We are not collecting money for weapons. We're collecting money just for protective gear and medical aid for Ukrainian fighters. And we only we also collect money for humanitarian assistance to the civilians. I think we want to participate because everyone feels like they should be participating. This is a pretty universal thing that what's going on in Ukraine isn't, isn't good. Um, and it's nice that these little things are happening to where we can contribute. It does feel like it's a good thing that everyone has kind of come together around. Yeah, we will stop doing this when the war will end. And since the war is happening, continuing these events is super important, especially given that with more and more time goes by, um, people get desensitized and they need to be reminded that this is still happening and we need help. We'll be back with your feedback and a thank you I need to say publicly. It's a sign of a good sense of humor and new technology. Larry Frohart shared the sign from Take 5 Oil Change at 68th and Wadsworth. It reads, free oil change for Teslas. It's like free blinker fluid for anyone. Teslas are fancy. They don't need oil changes, fuel filters, or emission checks. Nobody needs blinker fluid, by the way. Tesla owners could always stop in for some of that car shop coffee in the waiting room, or maybe gloat over the rest of us gas guzzlers. Catch a sign that catches our attention. Uh, Hashtag hey next as you know, or email us uh, next at 9news.com. I once tried to get an agent while working as a reporter in Colorado Springs. I had glasses more bold like this, uh, and the only feedback he gave me was get rimless glasses. Uh, the ones I had were too distracting, and he didn't listen to anything that came out of my mouth. V, Greg, and Doris, thanks for the validation. They gifted me five additional glasses tie clips. I got a note thanking me for my work on complicated topics. It also said Greg collects old hand-painted and unique ties from before 1965, and his most recent purchase came with 12 tie clips, including five that look like glasses. He immediately thought of me and sent them my way. I will gladly wear them, though V, Greg, and Doris, perhaps I might not always wear them at the same time. Your feedback tonight, Dina says she likes seeing public figures who wear glasses. LASIK scares her and looks like she looks like a weirdo without her glasses. So do I. Jim says, why can't the governor call a special session to enact the provision in the executive order? He could. I think the question is whether or not lawmakers think they have all of the legal language to make sure that it couldn't get challenged. I'll check with him and see if he plans on it. Look at that rack focus.